So far, our process to find the solutions to a system of linear equations looks something like this. Step one, put it into a matrix. Step two, we're going to do a bunch of elementary row operations to manipulate that matrix. And then what we've just learned is that the, the ideal goal is to take this matrix and via those elementary row operations, turn it into this nice form, either the row echelon form or the reduced row echelon form. So in this video, I'm going to do a little bit of that. We're going to take the system of linear equations. We're going to put it into a row echelon form. And then after that, what we're going to do is figure out how do I write out the solutions if I have it in row echelon form? How do I know whether there's the zero, the one, and the infinitely many? And if, like in this example, there's, there's infinitely many solutions, is there a nice way to write that down and to describe these infinitely many solutions? And indeed, we're going to see in this example that there's actually going to be two different infinite families of solutions. So the first part is the somewhat tedious process of putting it into row echelon form that we are going to see an enormous amount of times in this course and we need to become very efficient at. First step, let's translate it from a system into a matrix by getting rid of the different variables and just looking at the coefficients and that constant of zeros on the right hand side. All right, there we go. Now, if I want to put it into row echelon form, remember our first goal is to have that leading one in the top left corner, if possible. Either that or a full column of zeros. Well, I don't have a full column of zeros here, so I want a leading one in the top left corner. I want to look here. Now, there's one way I could do this. I noticed down here in the second row, I already have a one. So why don't I just alternate row one and two, and that's going to put a one up where I want it to be. So I'm going to put a long error arrow. I'm going to write down my instruction. It's that row one is going to interchange. I use a double arrow to denote that with row two. And therefore, that is going to give me this. Note that here, I haven't changed the third row at all. I just copy and pasted that. It was only the first two rows that switched. All right, so I've got the beginning of my staircase going on. I've got this leading one. Now, next up. I want to have zeros beneath this leading one. In other words, I want to have a zero where this two is, and I want to have a zero where this minus one is. Now, I think we can do this. I'm going to do these two steps at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to draw an arrow. Let's do the first of them first. So I'm going to take my row two, and I'm going to replace it with the old row two. And because I have the value of, of two here, I'm going to subtract off twice row one and two minus two times one will be zero so that's what i'm going to hope for and this is going to give me well the first row doesn't change at all one minus three minus one six zero i didn't touch that now it's the second row that i'm changing this does matter i have a zero here that was by design and then i have minus six minus twice minus three so this is like minus six plus six in other words zero then minus one, minus, and I'm going to multiply this minus one that I have here by two. So minus a minus two, which is like plus two. And so this is going to give me a one. And then eight minus twice of six, this is like a 12. So eight minus 12, a minus four, and finally a zero. Now I'm going to do the, the row three adjustment at the same time. I'm allowed to do this sort of at the same step because both the change to row two and row three are only involving row one. There isn't any weird like logical dependency going on there. So I can sort of do them independently. So it's my row three that's changing. And I notice here that if I take row one, which is a, a one in that first column, plus row three, which is a minus one in that first column, one and minus one add up to zero. And so that's going to work. So I'm going to send this to the old row three plus row one. 1 and minus 1 is 0, minus 3 and plus 3 is another 0, minus 1 and minus 1 is a minus 2, 6 and 2 is 8, and finally a 0. Now, if I look at what I have here, I'll notice that my staircase is, is looking a little bit more staircase-like. There we go. I have a leading one, I have zeros beneath it, it goes over to the other one, but I don't have a 0 beneath that. That's my next problem, my next challenge that I want to deal with. So, let's deal with that. I'm going to take my row three here. That's the one I want to fix. And it looks like if I take the old row three, because I got a minus two here, if I 
add twice row one, that should make it be a zero here. Okay, let's see what we get here. Copy and paste in the first two rows. And then for the second, well, nothing's changing here in the first two entries, just a bunch of zeros. By the way, this, this convenience where I don't even have to think about these and these are zeros are partly why row echelon form works in the first place. Then by construction, I have a zero here. That's what I was going for. And then I'm taking my eight and I'm adding twice the minus four. So that's a minus eight. It happens to be a zero there as well. And so I get this matrix. And then if I want to sort of look at what my, my staircase has become, I come along, come along, and that's what I have. So I get this row of zeros at the bottom. Now, I want to note a couple things. First of all, if we look back over here in a prior step, we, we had this leading one that appeared. No, that was just by coincidence that it happened to become a one. If it had been some other number like seven, we would have had gone through a step like divide row two by seven. So sometimes you can get kind of a little bit lucky when you're doing your row echelon form. Sometimes you can make choices that result in it working out easier or more challenging. The other thing I want to note is that you notice how I've, I've written down these arrows and I've given the instruction. Well, in a sense, you don't have to do that. You could do these manipulations, and if you were correct, that'd be okay. However, I would caution you to do them. Even though we're going to do an enormous number of computations like this, it makes it way easier, at least in my mind, to have the explicit codification of what I'm doing. It makes it less likely for me to make mistakes and more likely that I'm going to be able to understand what it is that you're doing and I can follow along. So I really like going in and writing these sort of instructions in off on the side. Now, that was the routine part. We have successfully put it into an REF form. If we wanted to, we could go along, we could put ones, excuse me, we could put zeros above those leading ones as well if we wanted to go to the reduced row echelon form. But as we'll see, this is going to be sufficient. Now, how do I actually solve this? How do I go and figure out what are the solutions? I think there's probably going to be infinitely many because I have this row of zeros here, but how do I do it? Now, I first want you to note, you see I have a leading one here, and I have a leading one here. And then I have these two different columns, uh, the second and the fourth column that don't have any leading ones. I'm going to refer to these as free columns. So these are columns that do not have a leading one. And the idea is, I have four different variables, x1, x2, x3, x4. I have two different equations that puts constraints on them, and then sort of two degrees of freedom, if you will. I've got the second and this fourth column where there's sort of no constraint. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my second variable, and I'm going to set it to be a free variable. So this is s, that's a free variable, and I'm going to take x4, that's the one in the fourth column, which also doesn't have a leading one, and I'm going to make that being t. And these two things are going to be referred to as free variables, or free parameters. And then my claim is that, that given this sort of arbitrary choice where I can let x2 be whatever and x4 be ever, then my x1 and my x3 are going to be constrained by the two equations that I have. So for example, if I look at the second equation, then what I can say is that my x3 minus 4 times x4 is equal to 0. Or in other words, x3 is equal to 4. And then since x4 was denoted t, it's going to be equal to 4 times t. So now I've translated. My x3 is now written in terms of these free parameters. And then if I look off the first equation, What I'm going to get here is that x1 minus 3x2 minus x3 plus 6x4 is equal to 0. That's what reading off of that first equation is going to give me. And then I can come from here and I can substitute a few things in. So, okay, my x2 is just an s. So x1 minus 3s. And then I have a, a, an x3, but x3 we know is 4t. And then plus 6, and, and x4 is also just t. So that is what I've done. I, I've translated everything but x1 into s's and t's, and I can manipulate it even one step further and say 
my x1 is equal to 3 times s minus 4t plus 6t is 2t, so plus 2t. And that equation, together with my original equations that I have over here, is a prescription for x1, x2, x3, and x4, all in terms of these two free parameters, s and t. So when we have this scenario, what we're going to say is there are two infinite families of solutions. If you give me any value for s and t, I can figure out what my x1, my x2, my x3, and my x4 is going to be. So there's infinitely many solutions, but they, they, they're clustered. They're clustered into these two different families, and the constraints of the system put these constraints on my outputs of the x1, the x2, the x3, and the x4. And then, in general, if I have, say, a hundred different free columns, I'm going to get a hundred different free variables, and I would have a, a hundred families of infinite solutions.